Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this latest teaching session in the course on technology and the future of medicine. Today, Jonathan White is talking about keeping body and soul together, myths of the near future. This is a part of the course that we've looked forward to for a very long time, and uh, he uh, puts quite a lot of uh, effort into each uh, presentation, each term of the course. And so it's always quite, quite intriguing to see what's new about the, the talk, which we'll find out in a few seconds. Just one uh, housekeeping thing. I, I remind you that on Thursday, we're changing rooms at 3.30. So we have the regular teaching session here in L1160. And then at 3.30, we go exactly one floor up in 1160. And so the student presentations will be in 1160 from 3.30, ending at 7. Okay, thanks. John, take it away. Thank, thank you very much, Kim. Um, so thank you for coming, and thanks for inviting me, Kim. Uh, I kind of wonder why Kim keeps asking me to come back here. Um, and I, I, in some, some ways, I, I wonder why I keep coming back. Um, move, move, move over there. All right. <laughs> there we go. Well, the, the trouble is I'm, I'm, I'm going to be moving around quite a bit in this talk. Um, so I, kind of, I don't know where to start. Kim's just told you that I put a lot of effort into this talk every time. This is the least number of slides I've ever done for this talk, this course, and really any talk that I've given, really. It's, it's very short. Um, and it's quite different from what you may have seen before on the, the, uh, the other videos. Um, I want to start off a little bit and say, why, why am I the guy giving this talk? Why, what's my answer to why do I come back? So I'm Jonathan White. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Surgery. I'm the Tom Williams Chair in Surgical Education. And I'm not from here. I'm actually from Northern Ireland. I got my training back there and then came to Canada for fellowship and stayed. And actually last year became a, became a Canadian. And I've always been interested in science and technology, kind of in the relationship to the future. Like I'm the first guy that I know who had an email address. The first guy who had a website or a blog or a wiki, and I have a podcast and all the stuff that we, that we do now. So I'm interested in technology, and I read Kurzweil's book, um, The Singularity is Near. I think probably back when we were in Calgary, it must be 2005 or 2006, I got it for Christmas. And it kind of blew me away where Kurzweil was going and all about genomics and nanotech and robotics. And that's kind of why I'm interested in the singularity in the, in the first place. Um, I am also interested largely because of my grandmother, because um, I remember probably when I was six or seven, she bought me um, issue number one of what would become a seminal publication in, in the UK. It was a comic book called 2000 AD. It's all about science fiction. And I don't know what she was doing to me, but she bought me this first issue of 2000 AD, and it spawned a, a lifelong interest in science fiction. So if you want to talk about Philip K. Dick, you want to talk about Arthur C. Clarke, you want to talk about the difference between the movie version and the book version of 2010, I can do that. I'm like, you should come to my basement and see all the science fiction stuff we have. So science fiction, I think, is interesting because it, it's supposed to be, or at least it tells us it's about the far future. It tells us about what's coming down the road in a hundred or a thousand years. But the best science fiction is, is about today, about our lives today and what's happening with us today. And it relates back to our current experiences. So we look at Philip K. Dick, for instance. Philip K. Dick, in all the books that he wrote, and it's tragic that he was poor when he was alive and he, and he died young, um, he, he writes about um, what, is it, what does it mean to be human? When he writes about books about androids, um, he's really saying what does it mean to be human and what does it mean for us to be human right now? And when he writes, this, the other main theme in his work is what does it mean, what is the nature of reality? What does it mean to be in one reality as compared to another and how does that um, relate to our everyday experience? So that's why I'm interested. I'm kind of technology and, and science fiction. I am a surgeon, of course. 60% of my time, I'm a surgeon over at the Royal Alexandra Hospital. I do a lot of work in general surgery and trauma, all sorts of things. But the other 40% of my time, I'm in academics. And I have, a, I have time to consider things. I've got time to write and to publish in areas of, of, of technology and in education. And I have time to travel as well. So this year, in February, I went down to California, down to Mountain View, and spent about a week at Singularity University, which is really the hub of a lot of the stuff you've been talking about in this, in this course. 
Um, and if you, if you look carefully, I am kind of just about here, and I'm the second guy from the, from the back. I'm this tiny little face in the crowd. And I saw Ray Kurzweil, and I saw Daniel Kraft, and I saw Peter Diamantis, all the guys who, largely guys, of course, who are talking about the future and singularity and stuff. And I went to the workshops, and I went on the visits and so forth, and I had a nice time. Um, and since that visit, I've been thinking a little bit more critically about the singularity. And I wanted to bring you some of the thoughts that I've been having and some of the ways that I'm thinking about the singularity that I wasn't thinking about before I, I went down to, uh, to California. Um, to refer back to my previous talks, the, the talk that I gave first was largely about the body, about experiences of mortality and death and what it's like to be a surgeon. Then in the second talk, um, I talked a bit more about kind of practical applications, like practical dilemmas that might come up in things relating to the singularity. And then last time around, I talked a bit more generally. I focused a bit more on medicine, I think, in the, in the last talk. And uh, this talk really has nothing to do with any of those talks. This talk is a, is a bit different. Um, because I think where I am with the singularity relates to this thing called Gartner's hype cycle. Have you ever seen the hype cycle? So there's a technology trigger at the start. This new wonderful thing happens. And everybody thinks it's the best thing since sliced bread. Up to the ceiling. And you reach this peak of inflated expectation. Robots are coming tomorrow. We're all going to live forever. We'll explore the galaxy. We'll never die. Right. That's what the singularity is. Here's where I am currently. Trough of disillusionment. I'm not sure the singularity even exists. Like I'm not even sure it's anything it's worth having a course about at the moment. And um, hopefully I'm going to get beyond that. And I'll take you up the slope of enlightenment and into the plateau of productivity where maybe we understand actually what the singularity is good for, what technology is good for, how this might develop in the future. Because I, th I think I'm kind of over that initial peak and I'm down in the trough. So I do have, I have come back from California with more questions than answers. And I want to ask you some questions here that are going to irritate you, that are going to annoy you, that are going to make you think he doesn't know what he's talking about. I, I want to piss Kim off a little bit here. Um, and you're supposed to be angry and upset and irritated and say, how dare you say that about my beloved singularity? How dare you say that? Um, and hopefully through this dialogue, I can get some answers to the, some of the questions that I've got. Maybe it turns out that some of the questions that I've got are some of the questions that you've got as well, perhaps. Um, so that's what I thought I would do with this session. And I, 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 I lined up, I think I made up nine things that I'm calling myths of, of the near future. Like nine things that I think people say about the singularity today that just aren't true. Or maybe they are true, but not the way that I'm thinking about the singularity. Um, I, don't want to, I, don't want you to make, I don't want to make you think that I'm referring to any specific individuals or, you know, or courses or entities or this course or Singularity University particularly, because there are a lot of good people involved in singularity studies. Um, and I don't, want you to make, I don't want you to think that I'm criticizing any one person in particular. But I think the, the questions I've got are about the singularity field in general, in particular. So, are you ready to start? Any questions so far? Hope I don't offend anybody. Um, so, here's uh, myth number one of the near future, which is that technology will fix everything. Like there is a technological solution to important problems of our age. Like, um, we don't have to worry too much about the specific solutions, but technology will take care of it for us. And you see this sometimes with people who say, well, we'll just, uh, we'll just develop a program for that, or a machine will take over this job, or um, there'll be an app for that, or we will figure out the, gen the genetic code and fix it, and it'll be gone. Or we'll just, argue, we'll just um, engineer a fleet of nanobots to go into your body to take the cancer out, and that's fine. Because um, technology is going to be the savior for everything, right? That's the point of this course. Technology is accelerating. It's coming. Everything's going to be good. Technology is your friend. Um, I think that is a load of crap. Um, because at least today and for the next foreseeable future, these things are in charge. Politics and practicality. And technology is nice. But there are lots of technologies that are currently available that we're not deploying the way we should do for these reasons because it's politically difficult or because it's practically impossible. 
I mean, ask people in Africa who can't get clean water how technology is fixing them when they work for and are subject to people who won't let them have access to this particular technology. Um, ask people who are in a, in a dead-end job how technology is going to fix their lives. There's, there's specific practical implications to technology um, which stop it being deployed. And if you read Kevin Kelly's book about, um, about technology, uh, where he talks about what, what technology wants, like technology is a kind of an, an autonomous automatic force, like it's another form of life. It ain't like that. It's just not like that. Technology is not everywhere, not going to go everywhere. It's not going to do everything. And I realize I'm, I'm over-egging the pudding here. No one's saying that technology is fixing everything. But I think there's a certain intellectual laziness in just giving problems that we should be solving and handing them to technology and saying, well, technology will fix that. There are major barriers to technology fixing lots of the things we want to fix. And uh, those are largely political and also practical. Second thing, I've, I, I've been at, I've been at uh, a talk where somebody basically said, don't worry about the details. The exponential curve will take care of it. So here's our classic exponential curve. Of course, it's a logarithmic scale on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And you can see that these are all the different technological things that have been developed from, you know, um, valves and radios all the way up to microcomputers and beyond, silicon technology. And exponentials are just going to fix it all, right? Like your computer will be twice as fast and half the price this time next year. So let's just wait around. We'll wait around for the iPhone 6 or the next BlackBerry phone, right? Because exponentials will just fix it. And it's interesting having conversations with people down in California where they just basically take it for granted that the exponential function will keep going. They'll say, well, yes, this is an enormous amount of data and it's very hard for us to understand that data. But don't worry, because your computer will be able to crunch it for you. It's, it takes like two years at the moment, but it only takes six months next year. And that may or may not be true, but I think it's actually, it is exponentially lazy to rely on the exponential function, because the, the harsh truth here is that the future has not, will not, and will never build itself. Like, we have to actually engage and go out and do things. And that means hard work and lots of failure and a fair bit of luck and a, f a little bit of brilliance from now and then. And that's how the future builds itself, um, i.e. we have to build it um, for ourselves. And if we leave it in the hands of people who say, oh, exponential technology will take care of it, that's not the case at all. So I think that's one of the most intellectually bankrupt statements that I've ever heard people saying, oh, exponentials will just, it'll just rise and it'll keep on going because the world ain't like that. I'm going to upset Shauna now. Shauna uh, loves big data. Shauna thinks big data is fantastic. Big data is the solution. We don't have enough information about the current problems um, we have. So let's just get lots and lots of information. And somehow, when we get a fuller picture of what's really going on, and that can be at a, at a, uh, a political level. It can be data from a country, or it can be data inside a body. It can be DNA. It can be. Um, things in the blood to get an enormous amount of data and then somehow we'll crunch that data and make some decisions and that'll be it. Big data is your friend here. Uh, I don't think so because I think big data is the problem um, because as we're seeing every day information is overwhelming us and it's separating us. I, I met a man down in California who had his, um, he had his genome, the genome of the flora of his GI tract run. And he classified all of the species and got all the, all the, all the genetic sequences. And he has, I think he said he had something like 15 petabytes of data, some enormous amount of data. And he told us this in a very impressive way. And we basically said, what does that mean? Like, how can you process or understand that amount of data? How does that help you in your day-to-day -day life? And he said, well, that's OK, because I'll just pull out a 3D printed model of my colon. I have some problems with my colon, so I got, it, I got it printed out in my 3D printer, and I have it here in my hand. And I looked at him and said, and how does that help you? So you've got this information about your anatomy, and you've got it in your hand now. Tell me how this is a practical solution to any problem that you have. Um, I don't get it. Um, I've talked before about I, uh, 
I have a stack of books and PlayStation 3 games and DVDs in my house that I'm not getting to. I just don't have the capacity to keep up with the information that's flowing towards me. There are too many good PlayStation 3 games. There are too many good movies. I haven't even seen Argo yet. So that's how, that's how far behind I am. Um, I was talking to some of the guys involved with the Google, the, 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 the Google Glass project when I was down in California. In fact, I was talking to a guy who looked me up live on his, on his glasses. Um, he said, you're Jonathan White, and looked me up and said, I can tell about you from the little picture on the screen. And uh, I was communicating with somebody from the project about the, the launch. They were saying that the, the glasses were ready to go out to, to developers. And they had this little thing where you had to, you had to send a tweet uh, which, with the hashtag Project Glass um, to suggest a use. And if your tweet was good enough, they might give you a pair of, well, you'd be able to, allow to buy a pair of glasses and play with them. And I saw somebody um, posted a tweet that said, uh, hashtag Project Glass, another technology that looks like it's supposed to bring us together but will really separate us. And you look at things like Facebook, when you look at things like Twitter, you wonder really, are they facilitating real, genuine online interaction? Or are they just getting in between? Can I not hear you speaking for the amount of noise that I'm making? I don't, I don't actually use Twitter very much. I only use it to, to broadcast. I almost never read Twitter because there's just so much information coming at you that I follow too many people on Twitter and it's just like a complete river of information going past. If you read a book by a lady called, um, you get Sherry Turkle, she wrote a book called um, Alone Together where she talks about people forming more meaningful, more meaningful relationships with their devices, including robots and um, smartphones, than they do with people. And they would rather have, have relationships with those devices than with actual people. Um, it's very interesting working in the hospital. If we are, we're working you know, in the operating room and we're in between one operation and another, um, what would used to happen would be we'd go to the coffee room, we'd have a cup of coffee together, we might make some toast and sit and sort of you know, shoot the breeze. Now what happens is everybody brings out their device and there's five of us all sitting closely related to our device and actually not relating to one another. So I don't think information is helping us here. And I think there's a, another book called the, the Information Diet, A Case for Conscious Consumption, where the author is basically saying, we need to slow down and think about what we're doing with information because just getting more of it isn't really helping. So. Oh, this is my favorite, actually, number four. Uh, we will harness this new technology to do amazing things, absolutely amazing things. We will, let's start with big problems. So let's get rid of hunger. We'll make, um, either we'll make food irrelevant or we'll make the means of food production so cheap that anybody can do it. Um, we'll draw water from the air. The moisture out of the air will come down and we'll get water that way. Uh, we'll eradicate all disease. We'll understand how cancer works. We'll understand how infection works. We'll understand how the heart works and we'll fix all that stuff. We'll radically extend life. We'll all, we've got to fix CO2 as well. We'll take all the CO2 out of the planet's atmosphere and we'll regulate that as well in some responsible way where we don't like, screw it up. Um, and it'll all be good. Any, any other problems we've got? Because the singularity is going to fix them all, right? I'm going to bring it along and fix them all. And that's a nice argument, except for this tiny little detail that we're not getting exponentially wiser or kinder or nicer to each other. And if you want any evidence of that, I point you to a couple of little events in the 20th century called World War II and the Holocaust. Um, maybe I can bring you back to the Gatling gun and bring you back to trench warfare. Those are technologies that didn't used to exist. They came along. We didn't use those to do amazing things. And I think some of the things that worry me most about the singularity are about the technology that's coming along that's getting more and more powerful, um, more and more widely distributed, that we have no control over. And that someone can use this technology to do a terribly bad thing, do lots of terribly bad things. Or, worse than that, they can use this new technology to do things that look good on the surface, and then 10 years later we, we decide they were terrible. What a, what a disaster that was. Because it turns out we're not very good at seeing down the road. We don't really understand ourselves very well. And it's all very well to have exponentially increasing capabilities, but we're not changing at the basis of this. We're just the same old stupid, weak, afraid people that we always were. Exponential um, processes don't really affect us or the way that we think. Number five, number five is popular. Um, the singularity is all about fixing these things. It's all about that. Let's get a billion people and improve their lives, right? It's one of the singularity projects. 
We're going to fix hunger. We're going to fix poverty. We're going to fix war. Somehow, we're going to take a place like this where somebody's living in a slum in South America and we're going to improve their lives in some fantastic way. Now, that, if you want to do that responsibly, you would, you would try and understand what it was about their lives they wanted to fix. In fact, you wouldn't fix them unless they wanted to be fixed because um, otherwise you're just another neo-colonialist. Um, and you'd assume you'd actually understand the real reasons why there is hunger, why there is poverty, why there is big war, why the big problems we have really exist. Not just our Western understanding of it, but the actual local understanding of it. And that's a very laudable aim, and I, I really applaud people who are working with the ideas of the singularity to try and address some of these big problems, and that would be wonderful if we could do some of those things. The problem is that some people seem to think that we can only do that after we improve life in California. So we can't really get to Africa before we do radical life extension. So everybody in California, well, sorry, the rich, beautiful people in California have to live for at least 150 years. They have to have some way of managing their email better. They have to some, have some new polymer that keeps the dust off their car. They have to have some new kind of sunglasses. They have to have a new pair of glasses, actually, that allows them to get information directly into their brain. Because um, those are the important projects, right? We've got to get Google Glass off the ground. Um, I was actually at a, at a Google Glass demo, and, uh, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a proponent of, of Google Glass generally, but this guy um, was showing us how they worked, and he said, I'm not a chemist, but I'm going to draw the molecular structure of caffeine. And he said, uh, he said OK, Glass, which is the trigger phrase to get the glasses working. He said, OK, Glass, uh, molecular structure of caffeine. And then he drew it on the, on the board, and he got a round of applause. And um, uh, the, uh, he said, I'm sorry that it's so slow. He said, the, uh, the glasses take about a second to recognize what I've said and then to show me the picture. And he said, we're working on a prototype that takes it less than a second. So at some point, it'll be like knowing it. Like you'll think molecular structure of caffeine and it'll just be on the screen in front of you. And he said, at that point, it's just question and answer then. There's no delay in it anymore. And that's what we're spending our energy and our attention on so that you or I can retrieve information um, in, in an instant when somebody's dying from hunger in another part of the world. Um, and maybe, I don't know, I, like, I'm going to be at the front of the line to get a pair of, of uh, glasses when they come out. But I have to say, as a society, it's not really a very morally wise choice. You know, maybe we want to spend our time and our attentions doing other big problems that can improve the lives of hundreds and thousands of people instead of my little life in California. Number six. Number six is the singularity is all about you, not about me. Uh, it's about improving your life. It's about enriching your life. It's about empowering you as an individual. It's about freeing you from the, the, the surly bonds of, of, of Earth. We want to make you live forever. Uh, we want to um, revolutionize education so that you can gain all this new information and, and actualize yourself in a way that's never been possible before. Um, these are all wonderful things, and we must do those right away. But first of all, I want you to buy my new book, my new video, or my new gadget. Uh, and for me, this is one of the most uncomfortable parts of the singularity because, or at least this, this, the, uh, the kind of group of people around the singularity, because when I, when I was down at Singularity University, I would, I would estimate probably a third of the people were tech people. Maybe a third of the people were physicians. And the other third were all venture capitalists. And venture capitalists are there to make money. And that's okay. We're in the West. It's a capitalist world. That's all right. Um, but I want that stated up front. I want when somebody is pushing an idea, if somebody is promoting something, I want, to know that, I want them to be able to tell me that this is something that they're benefiting from themselves so that I can look at it critically in that way. I want to know what the conflict of interest is because sometimes I wonder if that's the point of this. I was talking to somebody recently, I was talking to two people recently about the singularity. I got a phone call from a friend of mine who's a sociologist and he said, uh, I hear you've given some silly talk on singularity thing. Can we have a phone call sometime and you can just tell me what, it, what it's about? So I, I set up a phone call with him, we had a chat and he said, it's not worth my time. He said, it's really not a movement. It's not a proper thing. It's just people talking about stuff, about the future and about technology. It's not really that, that important. He said, I don't think it's a proper sociological phenomenon. The other thing was my, my wife said recently, she said, um, I hear you're, um, 
you, I hear you talking about the singularity thing and you've read the books and everything. She said, but I've never actually asked you what is it? So what is the singularity thing? And I said, I'm starting to think it's a marketing campaign. Like it's a campaign to sell books and DVDs and YouTube videos. And I'm starting to think maybe that's it. And maybe there's a kind of a darker side of the singularity that really hasn't been explored just yet. Because there's a lot of people who are out there with selling their wares connected with the singularity. So I don't know if that's true or not, but I'm just saying. Um, myth number seven is a rising tide lifts all boats. So the plan would be, let's focus our efforts on the Bay Area in California. Let's, um, let's do some radical technology there. Let's uh, do some life extension. Let's get all these devices. And then let's, in fact, manipulate some, GN, some DNA. Um, let's do some personality downloading. Let's download you into a computer somewhere and then put you back again. Let's get a substrate somewhere and put you in a, in a body that's not yours. Um, and somehow those things that are developed over here will affect everybody. It'll be so much better because technology will be everywhere and these things will be developed initially for the very, very rich and as time goes on they will get less and less expensive and somehow it will uh, migrate out across the planet so that everybody can have this because when the tide goes up all of the boats go up. Um, the trouble with that is that that's not how the world works um, because sometimes you get left behind. Um, and in fact, there's no reason why you would have a powerful technology and give it to people for free, especially if it provides some competitive advantage. And this is person to person or country to country, perhaps. Remember that politics and practicality thing? We talked about it at the start. Um, so and it, it actually relates back to what Bibiana Kuchek says about the haves and the have-nots, um, that singularity will enable the lives of the haves. And maybe if we remember, we'll improve the lives of the have-nots. But I kind of worry about the fact that lots of people are going to get left behind. And I'm not 100% sure that it wouldn't be so bad to be left behind, I think. Um, when you look at some of the arguments that are being advanced for the singularity and what it means for humanity as a species, um, some days I, 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 I actually don't want to be bio-enhanced. I don't want to be um, modulated. I don't want to be uploaded anywhere. And I'm starting to get worried about what that's actually going to look like and the fact that I won't be, I won't be me anymore. I kind of wonder about whether I'm actually looking forward to being left behind, like the boats on the beach. Um, here's myth number eight. We just need to change a few little things about life the way we know it today, and then everything will, will, will get better. This is the kind of simple solutions idea. That, in fact, I was having a conversation with somebody on Facebook recently about um, the, uh, the causes of cancer. Um, and we were going back and forth about the different causes of cancer. And I said, well, it's, it's a terribly complicated multifactorial disease. Um, and it works one way in one person and another way in another person. And it's your genes and it's your environmental exposure and it's your diet and it's different activities you have. And there's certain, num certain um, random chance in there as well. It's a complex phenomenon, basically. And pretty much everybody who was commenting on Facebook said, yeah, but it's the immune system, right? I'm like, no, it's lots of things. Uh, but it's diet, isn't it? No, no, it's not diet. It's smoking. No, 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 it's not smoking. Because there are people who smoke until they're 100 and, and never get lung cancer. It's terribly, ter terribly tempting and seductive to say there's a single solution here. There's just one little s switch we can flip, boop, and then there you go. That's all fixed, right? There's something we can do in the brain, some switch in your DNA, and then uh, everything will be better. The trouble is that those little switches involve things like changing your brain, changing your DNA, changing your thoughts, and basically, as I said before, kind of changing the very essence of your being. And I'd refer you to a talk that I, uh, actually a couple of talks I heard down in California. One guy said, be careful what you're thinking, he said, because he reckons that as we develop new software to map your brain, uh, you'll be able to essentially do a forensic analysis of your neural activity. So somebody will be able to do, take some kind of reading from your brain in the future, and from that reading, impute not just what you were thinking at the time, but backwards, because there's physical and chemical processes in the brain that relate to each other in time. So he said it's very important that you're, you're radically honest today, because it could be that there's a point in the future where somebody will 
will get a tracing of your brain and prove that you weren't thinking what you, what you actually were thinking. Um, so don't tell anybody you love them unless you really love them. Don't tell them you like their talk unless you really like their talk. And I have to say, I, I could not take up his challenge because that would have meant I had to put my hand up and said, you're full of crap. I don't want to live in a world like that. Because um, I think we're a society and we're people and honesty has its part, but we're not able to be radically honest all the time. It just doesn't work. Um, the other talk I went to was by a, a neurologist. And uh, he, again, he talked about how the brain works and he talked about how uh, some of the processes in, in the brain could be, could be changed. And he started off talking about diseases. And he said, let's talk about how we fix Alzheimer's. Let's talk about how we fix Parkinson's disease. Let's talk about some of the other brain diseases we could fix. And then once he had fixed those, and it'd be a massive task to fix those, but once he had said how he might fix those, he then said, well, there's some other stuff we should try and fix as well. There's this thing that we have called unhappiness. Let's get rid of that. There's another thing we have called regret. Let's get rid of regret. In fact, if you look at the big problems like war and poverty and hunger, those are created by people who don't think properly. So let's change the way that they think, and then those problems will go away. And he's, it's actually quite Orwellian. He's kind of saying, I'm going to engineer your brain to do things right. I'm going to take away your will to be an individual. I'm going to take away any spark of uniqueness or individuality you have because, uh, because variation is wrong, and we're going to make everybody the same. And that's a scary thing. And I don't want that guy on my brain or in my DNA or changing the way I think because that, if we're, we're talking about that, I want to be left behind, thanks very much. I'm happy with my broken down, ailing body. Um, if, if it means that I can keep the essence of what I, what, at least what I think I am, who knows what I really am. Myth number nine is, uh, I can't wait for the future, are we there yet? Which is this idea that, you know, it's, it's, it's all coming and it's so fast and things will be better next year than they are this year and it's all going forwards. Um, it's funny, if you go back in history, Margaret Thatcher just died yesterday. Um, you go back, back to the 1970s um, to the, pro the problems with deflation and collapse of economies and socialist governments in Europe and all that kind of stuff. The, the main feeling among the world in those days was that the world was going backwards like it was good after the Second World War, and there was 1950s in America, there was Macmillan in, in the UK, you've never had it so good, and suddenly when the 70s hit, there was a fuel crisis and not enough money, and everybody was going backwards. Um, and we've gone from that to this forward-looking society at the moment, you know, saying, well, technology is the fix, and we're going to go forwards, and, and it's going to be wonderful, and, and uh, don't worry too much about it, to the point where you know, we have celebrations, we have a, like a celebration called Future Day, right, where we celebrate the future, which to me is a bit like celebrating the sun coming up tomorrow. Like the future's coming, you know. It doesn't come any quicker if you have a thing called Future Day or not. Nice that we're talking about these things, but it's not really a, a meaningful thing to me. I, I think the harsh truth here is that if we're not careful, and maybe I'm talking to you guys here, like if you're not careful, then these may be the good old days. You might look back and go, I'm sorry I ever heard of this singularity thing. I'm sorry I ever heard about exponential. I'm sorry I ever heard about robots. Um, because we don't have the wisdom to drive these things forward in the, in the proper way. And you might look back to 2013 and go, how simple it was back then, how straightforward it was back then, before it got terribly complicated. So you might ask, Dr. White, this is terrible. What am I going to do? Um, like, where do we go from here? You've asked all these awful questions, and some of them are reasonable, and some of them are unreasonable. What are we going to do? Um, I think. The messages I wanted, want you to take away is technology is not going to save us. Like, we're going to save us. And we're going to use technology in a certain way, but we shouldn't rely on it too much. Um, second thing, I, I, I said this on the first day in Singularity University. I think, I, I think it, it wasn't very popular. First thing is I said, I haven't drunk the Kool-Aid. Like, I must have missed that part. So I don't quite believe this whole Singularity thing. So and I don't want any more of your, of your Kool-Aid. Thanks very much. Um, and the singularity is not, and, technology, and technological enhancement is not going to solve all our problems for us. It's just going to replace our current set of problems with a new, more complicated, more interesting set of problems, which is fine because we like solving problems. But it's important to know that there will be problems um, that we may not uh, foresee. Um, the other thing is the future is going to be a bit more complicated than you think. 
like a bit more messy. Like it's not going to be like a like a like a checklist. We'll just check off these diseases and they'll be gone. We'll check off these big problems and they'll be gone too. It's going to be more complicated and more messy, potentially more fun actually, um, than you think. Because the future, as I said before, comes through hard work, brilliant ideas, and luck. And it's about being in the right time at the right place with just the right idea. Just the first little simple thing that changes the world. Um, maybe. I mean, maybe I'm wrong here. Maybe we all will live forever. When I was down in California, um, w one of the guys, he was sitting in front of me, he, he, looked like, he looked like he was about 25. And uh, he was asked to, or it was the end of a talk, and he, and he was asked to give a question. And he stood up and he gave more of a comment than a question. He said, he said, I firmly believe that I will never die. He stood up and he said, I'm going to live forever. And no one laughed. There wasn't a smile. People said, yeah, you're probably right. You know, he's going to live long enough that he probably is going to live forever, right? Technological enhancement is going to come and the singularity is going to come and he'll be transplanted in a robot body and we're all going to be good. So, and he was not joking. It was not a, it was not a matter for laughter. It was a matter for, yeah, you know, you're right. Like you're young enough that you're probably going to make it. Um, I was t sitting beside, uh, uh, I think, a cardiologist um, during... Ray Kurzweil's talk. And I said, I wonder is Ray Kurzweil going to make it? Like, is, does he think he's going to make it or not? Like, is he going to live long enough to get transplanted into whatever he's going to get transplanted into? Or is he going to get frozen when he dies? Like, how's this going to work? Um, so I'm not saying that we're all not going to live forever. I'm just saying it might be more complicated than that. If you, if you want a, a science fiction tip, um, there's a book came out at Christmas time called The, the Post Mortal, um, which is probably one of the best singularity books or singularity type books that I've I've read it's actually, actually better than the Cory Doctor or Charles Strauss one about the, about the rapture of the nerves. Um, and it starts on a very simple premise. And I think maybe it, it actually is fairly realistic for what, what could potentially happen. So the very simple premise is this. A doctor somewhere in the clinic in the States develops a, a technology for radical life enhancement. And you get the, the treatment and it stops you aging. It stops you aging at whatever age you are when you get it. And initially it's banned and it's only available on the black market. So only rich people can get it. But at some point, there's such social pressure that um, the government has to give it out to everybody because some people are dying and some people aren't dying. And splits families apart, splits relationships apart. So finally, you've got, you've got and it's set in America, right? You've got America with lots of people getting this radical life enhancement thing where they never die. And it takes you to the, takes you to the very far expanses of what that would actually mean when you've got people being born and not dying. What does it mean when your population explodes by a hundredfold? Like, what is it like to live in a country like that? Um, there's the, one, of the, one of the most striking bits is where China decides that um, the only way to control its population is through nuclear explosions. So it sets off nuclear devices in three of its largest cities to wipe out, wipe out its population just to control the number of people that they have. Um, and by the end of the book, uh, maybe I shouldn't spoil it for you, by the end of the book, they start to think maybe we don't want this technology anymore. Maybe we have to do something else because this isn't working for us when you've got all these people on the, on the planet. So that's, that's my recommendation. Um, what would I like to see, I suppose, in the, in the future? Um, I'd like to do some stuff like today that we can do today with actual technology we have today. Like not some far future thing that hasn't been invented yet, but fix some actual problems with some technology we have right now. And that's why I think the people who are working on water in Africa and cures for malaria and getting simple drugs out to people where they can make a big difference, and those people should be applauded. Um, I don't like this idea of top-down solutions. I don't like the idea of flying to Rio de Janeiro and saying, here is your solution from Canada. I think it's got to be about local solutions. It's got to be about community building, and it's got to be about enabling better decision-making. It was a, a nice um, talk last week in the University of Alberta my wife was talking about, and she said... Um, they were looking at, at, I think, rates of waterborne infection uh, in different communities. I can't remember which country it was, different community in a, in a country. And they said that the villages which had decision-making systems which were more democratic had lower rates of infection. Like, it wasn't rocket science. It was people who were making decisions together had less disease than people who, who made decisions through aut autocratic means. So if you can educate people and get them to make better decisions, they take care of themselves a lot of the time. Um, I think, um, and this is, it's, 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 it's not quite ignored um, in singularity stuff. 
There's quite a few TED talks about this. I think we need to understand ourselves a bit better, like understand how we function, how we think, how we work together as, as societies. Because if we can get that part together, we can actually figure out how to integrate some of these technologies a bit more responsibly. And, and the other thing is just try to hold on. Like try to do your best in what are going to be fairly disruptive times. Something new is going to come, it's going to look like it's a fantastic thing, and then it's going to fall over. And then something else is going to come. And those cycles are going to probably come quicker and quicker. I mean, al already you're, talk you're seeing university talking about MOOCs, right? Talking about replacing classroom learning with online learning fairly big style, places like Udacity and edX and Coursera. Um, and that's only the start of the, of the, of the disruption in, in education. So I, I don't quite know what's going to happen next, but I think it's going to be interesting. I, I'll leave you with a quote from Martin Luther King, actually. Um, this is from, uh, obviously from the 1960s. Um, and uh, King said that our scientific power has outrun our spiritual power. He said we have guided missiles and misguided men. And it's, it's not just, I mean, I'll, I'll be dead soon, you know. You guys are going to live a bit longer than I am. Um, so it's going to be up to you guys to figure out how to use this, some of this technology as it comes through and how to figure out how to use it a bit more wisely than we have in the past. So that's all I've got for you. I am very happy, as you might imagine, to take any questions you've got. So I, I uh, welcome this. Um you know, we promote this course as being about balance and uh, diversity. We, we rely a great deal on uh, Earl Waugh's skepticism as kind of the balance to the hype of uh, uh, technology fixing everything. And um, I think if you think of the role of a course like this, what are we trying to do basically are we trying to fool these students into thinking some, you know, semi-religious misbelief that isn't true? Or were we, are we trying to really tell them what reality is? I, I think we're trying to tell them what reality is. And that comes as a balance from people holding different views across a spectrum. So they know about David Pearson and his belief that you can get rid of suffering and regret entirely and they've had the opportunity to you know challenge him directly about it there seems some very impractical things about that <laughs> and I, I, I think one of the the long-term lessons they take away is this opportunity to look David Pearson in the eye and say but don't you think that this might not work very well. It's not even desirable, maybe, in the first instance, you know? Do people really want this? Does anyone want it? Um, I think you've gone to Sing Singularity University at a very interesting time where they've just gone from nonprofit to for-profit, and, and it's a beneficial for-profit, which is a special California deal but still, it, it's, it's a change in thinking, and it's bound to be reflected in some of the interactions there, that it's just clearer now that they're trying to make money than, than it was in 2010 when I was there. I, I wouldn't connect much of what I'm saying to my experience of Singularity. I've kind of been questioning the Singularity for a while before this. I wanted to kind of go down and see what it was like. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think that... Um, it would have been kind of boring if we take your first talk and if, ever, if your views had not changed a bit since then, if you hadn't really shown any personal growth, if you were sort of <laughs> stuck at that point, you know? And you say, well, how many ways, it, it's sort of like a puzzle using the same words, you know? How, how many ways can, can you reconfigure those words to make them look different? Now you, you're actually thinking differently. And, and I think it's much more valuable for the students. They've, they've got your uh, intellectual mind power focused at this problem at several different vantage points now. And, and, and I think that, that's, that's got to be valuable. And um, the, um, this, 
plan of, of uh, what this course is about, if it's just the kind of weak extension of, you know, Singularity University, Singularity Summit, then we, we, we don't have the resources to yeah. do anything, you know? If it's something different, if our aims are different, if, if it's more reality-based, if it's more about diversity and multiple points of view, then we, we, we have a really unique role to play. And I, I think that's kind of how, how, how I see it. And I think your talk today has uh, contributed to that. I think the broadcast quality video that we do also is valuable here. Think if there was no record of your pre previous talks. Well, then people would think, <laughs> well, you know, how, how do we know? But now there, there's a really excellent, one can watch sort of the, the, the growing up of, of Jonathan White or whatever you want to call it. Growing up, growing si sideways, whatever people believe about this, you know, I, I, I think that makes it really interesting. Okay, there must what, be other... What, what do you think? Is anybody as worried about it, uh, as worried as I am? As you can see, I'm, I'm a little bit worried. First off, thanks for the talk. It's really cool. Um, kind of on this whole rising tide lifts all boats, or maybe not, do you think that it'll be, there will continue this trend of, oh, we've got to get this new best, coolest thing in uh, California, you know, we've got the Google Glass now, and now we're working on this thing in our brains. Also in Africa, we're trying to, you know, get running water now, but, you know, we'll, we'll focus on California first. Do you think this is something that'll just continue constantly as uh, technology increases or whatever rate it is? Um, I, I think you'll probably see a bit of increasing separation. I think, I think the people who have the money and the technology um, will probably move ahead. I think what will, what will probably happen is some of that technology will spill over by accident. So if you look at what's happening in Africa at the moment, nobody has a laptop. There's no wireless internet. There's no Wi-Fi in, in Nairobi. Um, but everybody has a cell phone. Like, they're just everywhere. And people are, people are doing more advanced things, say, for payment in parts of Africa using their cell phone than we are here. So it turns out that, that you develop this thing over here. It turns out you know, it's a, it, it wins in this context for mobile phone. Uh, communications, but it wins in Africa for something completely different. I think that's where the, where the local context comes in. So, I mean, and I, I, I don't want to be, I'm not singularity bashing, I'm not anti-singularity. I'm simply saying I have some questions that I'd like, to, you know, to, to consider. Um, and I'm also not saying we should, like, put a break on the Bay Area and everybody should stop, then we should fix Africa, and only when that's all the problems in Africa are fixed then we come back. I think it, there's room to do a kind of twin track thing. But I don't think I want to get us to run away completely with the West and forget about everybody else. Because it's the planet we're talking about here. Cool. Thanks. So I had a question. Uh, you said that we're not getting exponentially kinder or wiser. So what are your opinions then on the current trend towards social corporate responsibility or caring capitalism? Are those real things? Yeah, yeah they are. <laughs> I it's mean, those are, those are phrases we use, but I'm not sure that anything has really changed um, in terms of how capitalism really works. I mean, certainly, you know, we want to source our, the products that our company works with from some ethically responsible place, I guess. Um, but if you look at how, how, how Apple makes its, its iPhones in China, you could argue that that's not particularly ethical, and we're buying those without worrying too much about that. Um, so I think we... And I suspect it is better than it's been in the past, but I don't think it's really changed an enormous amount. I think we say the words, you know, socially responsible, socially accountable, but I don't think we've, I don't think we've, we've changed in our hearts, really. That's, that's my opinion. Thanks. Um, I just have a question. Uh, when you were at Singularity University, you know how you're with a bunch of, like, intellectual people? Did no one, like, really question it there, or was everyone pretty gung-ho about it? Um, I think I was sitting in the back row and there were some people who were, we were kind of having chats going, do you really believe this? I mean, there were clearly some people there who were totally all over it and yes, I'm going to live forever. But the problem is when, when you're a physician, you work in the real world with real sick people in real hospitals and you see how difficult it is to get technology into those environments. So, I mean, you might be hearing somebody talk about synthetic virology or about modifying the DNA of the brain, but I know that I can't get a, I can't get 
a medical record, like a piece of information to transfer from one system to another in the hospital. So uh, the idea that some of these developments are coming anytime soon, or at least will be put into an environment where it makes a difference to people anytime soon, is quite unrealistic. And I think a lot of people, a lot of other physicians there are like, well, this is interesting theoretically, but how is it ever going to get on the ground practically? You know, it's going to be ex extraordinarily expensive, extraordinarily difficult. And why, why would you want, or how are you going to get people to actually adopt some of these new technologies if it's not in their, in their direct interest? So I think, I think there's a certain amount of, of uh, skepticism in the, in the room, which is very appropriate. Do you feel like physicians have like a better view then, a more realistic view then? Um, in sense? I think maybe we're, I guess the physicians who are interested in technology um, are probably um, more grounded in reality. The, the tech people are purely tech and, and, the, and the company people are purely you know, commercial. But um, at least for medical devices, we're trying to figure out how would this actually work in the in the real world. And I'm sure there are lots of other people who are probably more qualified than physicians, but that's just what I, what I happen to be. I want some more questions. Um, one of the things that happens when you have accelerating technology is unintended consequences. Yeah. Can you talk about some of the unintended consequences you can see happening in the near future? Um, well, I, th I think you can see some, some of them today. Um, I think, I mean, look, at, look for instance at our distracted driving law. So you've got people who have a technology in the car with them that can allow them to, to communicate all the time. And it can be email or it can be text or whatever. And um, you would think that would be a good thing. That would be wonderful to be able to communicate 24-7. But it turns out that people don't employ that responsibly, even when there's a, a distracted driving law, which means that we are going to get fined if we use our, our devices. Most people, well, a lot of people still use them anyway and crash into the back of somebody's car, right? So that's a, that's a, that's a very simple example of a technology that was supposed to be for one thing, we misused it and it turned into a bad thing. And it turns out we can't even regulate it for that now. Like even when you put the law on, people don't stop. And and, and that's only one example. I think there's going to be lots more examples as well. And I think, I talked about this in one of the previous talks, where it's all very well talking about this in theory. Say, well, okay, if, if this technology existed, then we would do that. There are people in this world who are going to be on the very sharp end of some of these arguments. who are going to say, well, if, if I don't try this technology, I will actually die, not theoretically die. Like I've got six months to live from cancer and I'd better do something. Those people are going to be put in a very difficult position and have to try things out, and they're going to be learning what the unintended consequences are personally, if that's the way we end up going with this. If you've got six months to live and they offer you a body you can, you can be downloaded into, well, why not? Give it a go. Then you're stuck in this body and you wonder, well, what, what happens now? So I think a lot of these ideas are kind of shocking and disturbing and frightening, um, and there aren't a lot of people talking about it. I mean, if I go to my colleagues, in the hospital in the university and say, hey, have you heard about the singularity? No one's heard about it yet. And it's sort of slowly coming out. The other thing I suppose is, I saw a posting on Facebook today about 3D printing coming to your operating room. Um, and in fact, the first, I, I enjoy going to singularity because they had a 3D printer there and we got to play with 3D printer and print some stuff. Um, I was talking to some of my colleagues uh, back here in Alberta and they said, we've been doing that for years, except we never called it 3D printing. It's just, that's the label it is now. So it turns out, if you're trying to replace a bone in somebody's jaw after cancer surgery, what you do is you get some images of, their, of the smaller bone in their leg below the knee, the fibula, and then you can make 50 copies of that on the machine that they have. And then you can, you can kind of operate on it and figure out how the configuration is and practice on all these copies before you do the, the real fibula. There's only one fibula in the leg, of course, and then you, you kind of do the practicing. They weren't calling it 3D printing. It wasn't sexy. They didn't call it singularity. It wasn't on the front of anybody's newspaper. Um, and I think to some degree, the singularity kind of retrofits. It kind of says, well, here's this wonderful technology, which is part of the singularity. People who are actually using it go, we had that 10 years ago. That's not new. There's a difference between people not understanding something and not wanting to understand something. and, and uh, what we're at now, I think, is, is closer to a lot of people having heard about this stuff and not wanting to consider or, you know, to go further with it. 
I don't know what point one would say that the singularity reached the mainstream, but on March 28th, there was a you know, Dilbert cartoon that basically explained what it was, and then a whole series of, of, of them with the robots doing really bad and scary stuff. And, and, and Dilbert is not mainstream. I, I would argue the singularity has not gone mainstream yet. Yeah. Like if you so, so, no, I, I think that that might be right, that, that uh, Dilbert is, is maybe a minority uh, pursuit. Um, the news about uh, Foxconn, uh, you know, getting rid of a million workers, replacing them with a million robots. Probably that news has not really sunk in with a lot of people. It isn't at home. It's, it's the other side of the world. Um, what do you think would make it um, mainstream? What coming event will, will bring this to the consciousness of most ordinary people? Mm, it's, it's probably a good distance away yet, the, the mainstream part. Um, and I think... It's, it's, it's funny, it's, uh, I was watching a documentary recently on the history of Silicon Valley um, and they talked about how microcomputers were developed, how the chips were developed at the start and they had um, the, the guy who uh, was in charge of the company that would later become Intel made a very radical business decision. So they were making these uh, chips for microcomputers and they were quite expensive to make and he decided that he would uh, put them on the market for a dollar a chip. And his, his executives came to him and, he and they said, it costs us more than a dollar a chip to make the chips. Like every time you sell a chip, we're losing money. And he said, don't worry about it. And of course, because they went for a dollar a chip and it was an easy price to remember, they started selling hundreds of thousands of chips and the demand rose and therefore the, the, the price per item uh, produced went down and the costs were driven radically down, almost down to down to zero, and that's when microchips and, and, and personal computers became mainstream, because suddenly they were available everywhere. So I would say you should look at that model, and the same model for things like color, te color television and radios, right? Um, you go back to those as well. So you're looking for something like an actual product that people can have in their lives and, and know. So it's not, um, it's not IBO, right? Too expensive, not enough of them. Um, it's not really the iPhone because it's not radical enough. In fact, Apple's got a problem now because what happens after the iPhone? Like, what's the next generation? Uh, is it going to be a watch? Who cares? You know, with iPhone 6, it'll be a bit like iPhone 5. It doesn't really matter. So what's the next radical breakthrough that's going to occur? And when that thing comes, people will look back and see all the, all the preceding forms, all the ancestor forms. Oh, yes, well, before this was the radical thing that came out, they had these things that were going on for 20 years beforehand, but nobody noticed until the radical breakthrough product. And I think maybe it's something like, I mean, it, it, and it's not just a new iPhone, it's, it, it, and it's not Siri, it's not artificial intelligence. Again, that's not particularly mainstream. It's going to be something that affects people personally. It's going to be something like um, some kind of anti-aging treatment, or it's going to be some kind of a, a, a cancer suppression therapy, or it's going to be some form of artificial intelligence that relates directly to you. It'll be something like, like that, that's suddenly available and you go, that actually works. Yeah. I think that there, there are limits of the technology now that are so simple, we, we don't even think about them. Most devices need power, and the power need, means they need to be plugged in sometime. And that is extremely limiting, and, and, and limits, you know, if you think of a robot like that, <laughs> it certainly limits the the you know autonomy of the most sentient ro robot if it can't go very far without having to be plugged in and re recharged. If you changed that, if 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 somehow charging was wireless, charging was everywhere. There was power wherever you went. You didn't need to worry about that. Then then then, then I think maybe you're closer to mainstream. I've I've talked a lot about that camera there, the amateur camera, which is constantly comparing the scene with ideal, you know, algorithms and, and, and taking still pictures. 
But there's always a person pointing that, and it needs to be plugged in too. So it's sort of limited in two ways. <laughs> that, that it's not a completely autonomous camera just floating around in, in the world. It has a human being pointing it, and then it decides when, when to take the pictures. And so many, many of the things that seem to be proof that we're almost there have, have extreme limits at the moment. Mm -hmm. And the power thing, we, we don't seem to be making very rapid progress. I guess if we did, then, then, then a lot of things could change. People would start thinking of wires as being really ugly. If you go into a home, see a lot of wires, well, that person just <laughs> doesn't get it, you know? It shouldn't be any wires. Well, I, I don't know whether you've talked about um, disruptive innovation in this class. Uh, I was down at Harvard last summer and I heard a guy called Clayton Christensen talk and um, he's a, a, a professor in the, Harvard, in, in the Harvard Business School and um, he started out working um, looking at microcomputer companies and the companies that were doing giant mainframe computers and he said you need one or two of these in a business and they're ex exceedingly expensive and essentially a lot of smaller companies came and basically ate up their business with microcomputers. And then smaller companies came and then ate those up as well, to the point where nobody needed mainframes anymore. Same thing happened with, uh, with um, steel production. They had these enormous furnaces that were producing steel at a very high cost, and they were the titans of the industry, and nobody ever thought that they would go away. And then they got, basically got, in, they got eaten from below by smaller companies that are smaller portable blast furnaces, which were able to, to do things more effectively and, and more, efficient, more efficiently. You talk to, when you hear Christian talking, he basically says, look at things that are in existence at the moment that you think are fantastic industries which will never be destroyed, which could never possibly go away because they make so much profit, they have so much revenue, and then say, look at the companies that are at the bottom of the market. Look at the companies who are making the really, really, really cheap products, the ones that have the really, really crap features, the ones that don't do anything today but they do the basic thing all right. You know, when the, when the microcomputers came out, the mainframe people basically laughed at them and said, why would you buy a computer like that? Like, it's so small, I could sit on a desk. You know, why would anybody want a computer like that? It turns out they missed the point, they missed the essential point of the product. So I think you should be looking around saying, where are the kind of big, lazy institutions that are kind of resting on their laurels today, and how can they be disrupted? How could I take their business and do it cheaper, faster, easier? because that's where it's going to come from. Some, something's going to be disrupted. Maybe it's, maybe it's a university, maybe it's healthcare. Healthcare is extremely expensive, extremely labor intensive, and very hard to do. Um, and maybe there's a, a simpler solution to it, and we're going to go all the way up the path of getting more and more specialized and more and more expensive and yada, 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 and suddenly something will, will disrupt healthcare. And I won't have a job anymore, and Kim won't have a job anymore, because that'll be the old model. So look out for that. There, there's a strange uh, phenomenon in the videos from, from this course. There's one video where the viewership is growing much faster than all the others. And that one is the one that begins with me talking about uh, Eric uh, Topol's um, demonstration using an iPhone of directly doing tests on a patient that before you would have sent them to a lab somewhere and gotten those tests done. And in the sub, so that uh, lecture, it, it was um, Michael Woodside's first lecture of the nanotech where I, I gave a six minute intro. We will never know what's causing this viewership to grow, whether it's my six minutes or his 70. But anyway, so, but subsequently every few days somebody sends me the link to that uh, NBC uh, Eric Topol thing as if you know they, they they just found it and they're so excited about it so it seems like maybe the idea of using of a physician who's examining a patient taking out his his iPhone and doing all sorts of scans and tests right there to the patient this is something that is a riveting uh, idea right now in 2013. Now, do you think that's a real idea? Do you see this uh, ha uh, happening? Is your examination of patients going to change in the next no. year or two no. in this way? Is it all going to be <laughs> iPhone-based? 
and they'll be calling you Dr. iPhone? No, no that isn't going to happen. Eh? I, don't, I, I don't think so. And uh, I, think the, I think the problem with videos like that is it's a bit like the Harlem Shake, right? It's popular for like two weeks and then it's gone again, right? Same as like Gangnam Style, right? It comes and it's gone and it's away again. And there isn't really... There isn't really a way for things to be discussed and to be sustained in the culture. And when it comes up, it pops up, it's gone again. There, I, I was watching a video with, um, I watched an, a, a, a video on CBC last night of an interview with Margaret Thatcher from the 1970s or, mm -hmm. or, the, or the early 80s when she visited Canada. And they had like 45 minutes of, of the interviewer talking to her and they discussed some fairly complicated problems. And the point that they made in the Evans Journal is that would not be permitted in today's culture. The idea that two people could be on, on the TV for 45 minutes talking about one thing. Um, and, and discussing it in some depth. I mean, the, the, the most amazing part for me was the, the interviewer said, I really want to discuss with you about public works. She said, but I don't really have time. And Thatcher said, no, I insist that you speak to me about public works. It's such an important thing. He talked about public works for a while, which is, how the, which is basically what the government spends money on in infrastructure projects like bridges and roads and schools and hospitals and that sort of stuff. Um, and that's how much the culture has changed in, from 1980 to, to 2013. You could not do that anymore. We, we, we lack um, a vehicle for um, in-depth discussion of things. Right. But now, here we, we would have, I think, the students in this course probably do more multitasking, you know, continuous divided attention than you and I do. Is this because they're stupid and just don't get it and they haven't read the studies that, that say that, they, that this is tremendously, you know, inefficient that if that they do much better at, at anything if they just concentrate on one task or do you think that they're actually getting some ways to proceed in life that you and I don't have those means we don't have that we we're, we're not as skilled at at figuring out how to do three th things at one time even though when you test it they're wrong. They're, 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 it's just, you know, it, it's just not working. The way that they behave day, day after day is just completely ridiculous according to the tests. But maybe the tests are wrong. So what, what, what do you think? I have several comments on that. The first thing is I think the, the differences between the generations have been exaggerated for effect. So I'm not sure there's much difference between a millennial and a Generation X person, really. You yeah. could argue maybe somebody who was born or somebody who, who came out of the baby boom or was a World War II veteran may be marginally different from somebody who's a Generation Y person, millennial. But I think this, the, the, the shorter periods of time probably is not that much difference. Second thing is there's no such thing as multitasking. There just isn't. <laughs> there, and um, this, I think there's actually pretty good literature for this. There is such a thing as rapid task switching to go from one to another, but your brain cannot do two things at the, at the same time. Um, and uh, I think, I mean, the, the other point I'd make is that uh, our reach exceeds our grasp, which is that if there are 45 things going on and there could be an interesting thing happen at any moment, then I, I don't want to miss out, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm sitting at my computer in my basement working on this talk, and I've got Facebook open, and I've got my email open, and my phone is there, because I don't want to miss a text or an email or somebody says something on Facebook, right? And I'm constantly getting distracted. But I do that voluntarily because I want to be distracted mm -hmm. from the boring task that I have, which is to make my slides. Um, so that's kind of okay. But it, it just shows you that we're not, I mean, you're talking about this, what I said before about, the, about our bodies not developing exponentially either. Like we have the same attention span that we had before. Mm -hmm. When you divide it, it's, a, it's the same sum divided. So of course you're going to be paying less attention to what, you, what you're supposed to be doing, and a bit, you're going to be losing a bit to Facebook and Twitter and all the rest, because yeah. We're the same old bodies that we were when we, um, when we fought the Battle of Waterloo, you know. This idea of, you know, alertness during the day, when you're productive, whether you can work on one thing for an entire day, how to make your life most productive, I think some task switching is absolutely necessary for a you know, productive life. If you try to do one thing for an entire day, you'll end up doing other stuff just because you can't make yourself stick to that one task. Yeah, I, for I, I'd say two things to that is it's okay not to be productive. Yeah. It's okay to spend a day when you don't do very much. That's all right. And the second thing is a lot of the things that occur to you um, that really move you forward do not occur during periods of work. They yes. occur when you're playing your guitar or you're out on your bike or you're going out for a walk and you're turning it over in your mind, you're talking with your friend and suddenly you go, 
that's, that's you want to write it down, mm -hmm. and it would never occur to you when you're doing it properly. There's, I think there's, a, there's actually a, um, a TED talk on this about about the, the about the benefits of distraction, about stopping what you're doing and doing something totally different for a while, and right. it gives you a different perspective on 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 your task. Right. I think we're off, off topic now. Let me ask you something else about uh, the Department of uh, Surgery and this particular course. Of course, we have three people teaching from uh, surgery. They're at different levels and, 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 and parts. But um, I would say we're, we're considerably dependent upon surgeons in general. If you look at uh, Abdullah Salah and then uh, Shana Panja and yourself, is that a strange uh, aberration? Have I done so, something quite, you know, uh, illegal in ma making this course so surgical? Is is it skewed and <laughs> you know aberrant in this way, or should we get more surgeons? When, the the when longer I talk in this course, the less I talk about surgery. Yeah, um, and I think, I mean, Abdullah and Shauna are. They're not coming to this course talking about their roles as surgeons. I mean, Abdullah's talking about his interests overseas, and Shauna's right. talking about it. Ent entrepreneurship. So, uh, personally, yeah. I don't think you're inviting them because they're surgeons. It, it just it, it happens yeah. to be that they're the they're, best persons they're, for the job where they're yeah. located. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're we're very grateful to surgery for having <laughs> provided all these three excellent speakers in the course. Uh, I I would say it's sort of interesting. Uh, Abdullah's video is so good from last term. That that um, I I'm sorry I I didn't make him part of the course this term, but it's a strange thing about the surgical call schedule. You know, he had given that talk three times, and I always loved it. But last time, I think he was actually rested, and and his mind was <laughs> so he was able to put every single piece together, and it, and it's just so intrinsically satisfying. Um, so I, I will get him live here uh, next term, but it's an interesting example because if you had asked me in the previous terms whether I saw any flaw at all in what he did, I would have said no. Mm. But it, it's clearly that, that with a little bit more rest and you know, continuous, <laughs> that's, that's what he says is the difference. He was simply more uh, rested last time, but it, 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 it is a really satisfying uh, video. Um, so thank, thank you for all your questions. I'm happy to take questions by email as well, so um, drop me a line if you like. Right, we, we still have uh, four minutes. Tell, tell me your thoughts about uh, 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 TED Med. You, you and I are both doing uh, TED Med. Uh, what are, what, is, this, is this an opportunity? Is, is it something we, we've blindly stumbled into that we never should have done? Or? <laughs> I, I don't know. I, 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 it's next Wednesday, right? I've got no idea what's going to happen. I'm just going to show up and talk about some stuff, tell some stories. It's, it's going to be fun, I think. Yeah. Um, but that, that's all. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, I think that's a pretty healthy attitude. Any other student uh, questions? Um, yeah. How important to the future do you think is knowing what's going on or what come, may come up next, like, you know, how we were saying how singularity really isn't mainstream yet. Yeah. How important do you think it is for the future that the singularity and all these ideas actually people know about them as opposed to, you know, the brilliant minds in California all thinking it through mm. and it just kind of seeping out? Um, I think, I mean, from, from a personal point of view, probably you want to keep up with what's happening kind of from a competitive advantage point of view to say, well, none of the other students know about this, I know about this, I can kind of see what's coming, you know. Um, I think it, it won't really go mainstream until it's relevant to actual people in their actual day-to-day -day lives. Um, and until that happens, it'll still be a kind of a, you know, a kind of a techie, nerdy thing, right? So, and, and maybe that's the way it's always going to be, until there's like a major breakthrough. But I, I think, I mean, it's, I think it's encouraging you're here talking about these things, thinking about these things, because when the next wave comes, and it, it comes in your field, then you go, ah, right, I can see that coming. I better jump on, on that wave. Thanks. Do 
Well, I, no, I'm, I'm actually look, looking forward to automated cars. Talking about the, about the Google self-driving car, the Sebastian Thrun autonomous vehicle thing. Um, uh, I, I, I've got a, I, currently I drive a Subaru, right, Subaru Forester 2007, and I need to get a new car sometime soon. And I, I want to get a hybrid or electric thing maybe, and I want it to be self-driving. Because why do I? I'm, I'm not good at driving. The computer's better at, better at driving. It turns out there are some limitations though. Because I had a friend who was trying out a hybrid vehicle recently in Alberta, and he said it, it wouldn't start when it was minus 40. It just wouldn't start. And he recommended we get a diesel, like you know, old-fashioned technology. And the other thing is that, yes, the autonomous car drives very well in California and it drives very well in the desert. They're having trouble with the algorithms for snow and ice. Um, and it turns out they're not able to drive just as well like that. And like 70%, 80% reliability is not good enough when you've got people in the car. It's got to be like nearly 100%. So uh, if there's one place on the planet that, that, that autonomous vehicles will not come to tomorrow, it's probably Al Alberta. I mean, here we are, April, and there's still bloody snow on the ground. Yeah. I guess on a side note, do you think it'll ever come due to like insurance and like the politics of everything behind it? Um, I, th I think it will actually come. I think the evidence will suggest, I'm hoping anyway, that um, uh, self-driving cars are much safer than, than me driving the car. Um, ab absolutely. Like if, if it can regulate the distance between me and the car in front and it's not distracted by stupid things, then I'm, I'm all for it. And I think it, it, it is going to come. I hope anyway. We're uh, out of time. Thank you very, very much for a really excellent session. Thank you very much.